Hello, hello guys. How we all doing? Oh, I gotta move my mic. Hold on, I'm gonna turn myself off. Testing, testing. There we go. That's much better. Welcome back. Welcome back. Back again. The 343 TV stream with your boy at Grismoth. Good to see you guys in the chat. I see some names I've seen before and some new faces. It's always good to see that. Welcome, welcome. All right, so... Now let's hop into it today. Um, we're shifting up the way that we're handling our streams a little bit. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on letting us kind of take a little bit of control, um, have a little bit of freedom with these uh, time slots of ours. And so you'll notice, um, you know, there's kind of a generic label now. And so I'm going to get to decide what we're doing for the rest of the day. Haha. <laughs> so cool. Today's going to be a track breakdown. And so I've gotten a, I guess, composed, well, we'll say finished piece of music here in Ableton. And this is a very old piece of music of mine. And so we're going to go back through it. We're going to listen to it, uh, note some things that I maybe did well um, and talk about what I was doing there and then fix some things that I almost surely have done wrong uh, just from some of my bad habits of old, right? So without further ado, let me actually play this piece of music for you. And, uh, you know, then we'll just jump in. You know, feel free to ask me any questions in the chat. I got you right here. So I'm always with you. All right, also let me know. Oh, I got to switch my audio. Streamers professional. Okay. 
let me know how the audio is if I need to turn it up or down I'm working with a limiter on the master right now which I do not recommend you do but for streaming purposes I think that's gonna make the audio a little cleaner sorry for this slight hold up here good time to caffeinate all right Rogan should be good So a little long, but that's what we're working with here. 
Um, certainly some good things about this, some problems with this, and I'll, I'll tell you some of these problems are coming from the fact that uh, certain plugins that I was using during the creation of this piece originally, I no longer own. I've recently swapped computers around, uh, you know, things have updated, things are no longer compatible, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we are going to be cleaning up some problems from just a bit of a broken uh, project file here. Um, but it's also very old in concept, and so some of the choices I made during production here were just bad habits or mistakes. And so we're going to kind of go through and look at what I did right, what I did wrong, and we're going to give this song essentially an out of 10 score of how, you know, how well this was kind of handled, taken care of, and we can go look at where it wasn't so hopefully you can kind of draw some lines back um, from some of the things that we talk about here to your own music I wanted to drop it 305 to hit harder yeah I understand that one for sure the dynamics in the song are kind of flat right it feels like it's just very much here the whole time um, likes the kick though I think that's good kick sounds good all right cool what's up Powell good to see you again as always Pavel sorry okay, we'll never pronounce that right I'm sure you'll forgive me Okay, so <clears throat> the other thing I think I saw in the chat was uh, synth is a little too loud, and you know there's a bunch of synths in here, so I kind of assume we were referring to this thing, which is kind of a very cutting sort of keyboard stab instrument, so uh, we can kind of pull that down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I want to kind of go through individual parts of this, look at them in a vacuum, which means just without context, right, put them by themselves and see if there's any issues here. Look at the uh, um, audio routing that I chose to have, um, and we're going to kind of break that down where it helps me and where it doesn't help me in certain instances and see if we can make any decisions here uh, that will lend to this track feeling a little bit more like what it wants to be. Uh, Mark Morgan asks, what genre are we calling this one? Uh, let me let me ask you guys, What if, if, uh, upon first playback and as I kind of go through and play through this a little bit, try and determine what genre this feels like to you. You know, we're in 96 beats per minute, but we have this kind of four on the floor beat, so it's a little slow for house in general, but it's kind of got that 80s house vibe, I don't know. So what do you guys think? I try to... Try to avoid that thought process. It makes my brain hurt. <laughs> I'll take your guys' suggestions. Uh, so cool. Yeah, let's take a look at some of these different parts here first. And before, I guess, we actually zoom into individual things, I think hopefully this project file will be organized enough for us to go through this and not be too confused about what we're looking at. Some of this stuff is MIDI. Some of this stuff was recorded with my keyboard here. Uh, some of this stuff is recorded guitar from my old roommate. Um, and so there's a few things that we're going to want to look at. Now, if I solo some of these sounds, we might notice that some of the stuff is kind of hard to hear. Like we have this sound here. Kind of barely remember that being in the song. We have this stuff going on over here. Which is very, very quiet, right? So there's some cool things going on we can't hear. So we're definitely going to want to take a look at that. Uh, but first, we want to decide arrangement-wise, does this make sense, right? The song's a little long. I mean, I know old music you know, is longer than new music for sure. Our attention spans have kind of shrank over the years when it comes to this kind of thing. But is there any moment in this song where I think things are going too long? And I would say maybe a little bit at the beginning. I mean, I've heard the song a million times, so I might have, you know, that sort of bias here. Uh, but I think the beginning runs maybe a little long, especially given that the chorus or the drop section uh, does feel very similar to the beginning here. And then the bridge. The bridge definitely doesn't have enough going on in here for me to warrant maybe all of this repetition here, especially since there's this sort of like introduction to the bridge here after the first chorus breakdown. I guess you could kind of call this the second chorus, but uh, it's a pretty different part of the song. We introduce uh, different chords, things of that nature. Um, so we got vapor wave. We got, I don't know, it's not important. Well, I mean, it's important for communicating, right? Like if um, I'm trying to explain what type of music we're working on to, you know, somebody who doesn't know production terms, then that requires me to use genres. I can't be like, oh, yeah, I'm using this type of drum set, this type of synth. They're not going to know what I'm talking about there. So it is helpful for sure. I just I don't necessarily know the answers there. I think 80s house makes sense to me, though. Um, I don't I assume it got slow, right? It's kind of a little like groovy, almost hip hop speed, 96 beats per minute. Um, I don't know. House music has gotten a little hyper these days. Right, 128 beats per minute, etc. Okay, so yeah, arrangement-wise, we are maybe drawing things on a little bit long. I don't know if I'm going to necessarily go through and make arrangement changes here right now. It might be a little bit um, tricky to, to slide that in there. I don't even know 100% what like automations are going on in here. This song is years old. Um, so if at the end, if we really feel like a, an easy change could be made, maybe we'll highlight, you know, for example, this middle section of the um, the bridge here so that I'm still getting the beginning without whatever the synth is but then the synth starts to build a little sooner and quicker and if I highlight this moment of time and I hold shift command or shift control delete it's going to actually delete time and pinch everything closer together so now I've effectively removed a measure out of this section without necessarily impacting the way it sounds
And even though that chain or that transition here wasn't intended or produced, it was just kind of stitched together, it sounds pretty normal. You know, any uh, automations that we have going on there will still kind of bleed through and stuff. So you know what? We might as well keep that change there while we're here. So I don't know. There's a little bit of an arrangement thing we could have done. I think, again, the intro could, could get a bit of a haircut too. So maybe... Nah, we'll come back to that later. We'll come back to that later. So there you go. That's some arrangement things to think about. But otherwise, I think just because of how much I'm trading off uh, the attention here, like what instrument is taking your attention and what the instruments are doing, I think we have enough variation throughout the track. Um, so let's start with some of our elements here. And just because it's me, um, we're going to really kind of take a look at our drums. And the way I do my stuff is probably going to line up with some of you guys. It's also going to be very different from some of you as far as especially if you're doing uh, drums in audio in audio channels on the arrangement view here. Um, so I have a unique drum rack for each of my like kick drums, snare drums, hi-hats, and percussion sounds, which sometimes I stray away from, which you'll hear uh, in this. I've actually kind of flipped hi-hats and percussion, so I'll rename those. Um, but the reason I like doing things this way is because I get just a normal Ableton channel here um, that I can slap a bunch of audio effects on, and I don't have to deal with creating audio chains, sends and returns within the drum rack and getting all messy like that. Uh, it just helps me to have unique tracks here. Uh, especially since I can then organize my layers. I can still put individual things like you. That's a thing I needed to delete. Uh, missing audio plugin. Anyway, uh, you know, I can put individual EQs on these sounds anyway. And then eventually they all go into a big drums group, right? Which allows me to still do processing on everything all together. This gives me sends and returns on the individual sounds, sends and returns on the groups. Uh, it's just kind of like a handy way of organizing things. It does kind of potentially get you in a little bit of trouble later if we're trying to bounce stems, right? So if I'm working with an engineer and the engineer wants me to separate all of these sounds out and I were to go through the normal Ableton bounce individual tracks, kind of, you know, bounce all stems sort of export, I'm not going to get unique processing from the group on the kick drum. It's going to bounce me a kick drum track without this stuff and then it's going to bounce me a drums group track with all the stuff and it's a little bit tougher for an engineer to work with in that way so you'd have to spend more time bouncing these stems by hand which is not a big deal but just one caveat of using it like this um, and so yeah we have on our kick drum here uh, a couple of samples that are probably playing on top of each other i like to have uh, a layer for my low end and a layer for my high end so i can assume one of these is getting a low frequency cut here Yep, so I probably did this in context. I was playing these two kick drums on top of each other and sweeping this cut filter around until the resonance of the two kick drums didn't affect each other in a negative way, but maybe in a positive way. Um, so that's how I blend the higher frequencies of this, which isn't much, just kind of like a kind of acoustic recorded kick drum. And then the really subby punch aspect of a trap kick drum to give me the bounce altogether. We get this kind of natural 80s kick drum. We have this going through a filter right now. So this is the full full kick drum, no filter. I'm running this parallel style, which might actually be a mistake here. Whoa, what is this? EQ? This is why we're doing this, because look at some of this old crazy stuff that I was doing. We'll see, we'll see. So I'm, I'm running this uh, kick drum through a multi-tool from Chris Lord Algae. This is a Waves plugin. I, I like these for speed producing, for sure. If I'm getting you know very particular about the engineering I'm doing, I'm probably not going to be using a tool like this. But for production, uh, this really helps maybe save some time if you're in the studio with somebody and you don't have too much, uh, too much time. Uh, the Counts really loves the kick. I'll send it to you. I'll give you guys this kick drum. Um, so we can have a low EQ functioning here, which just is either an increase or a decrease. It's probably a shelf. Same thing with the high frequency. Uh, we have a little bit of a compressor going here, a little bit of a reverb going here, and a gate. And the gate is actually causing these drum sounds to be uh, shortened on the, on the pass through this tool, which is why I have this 50 50 So in my eyes, essentially, I think what I was thinking here is this CLA drums tool is handling the punchier aspect of my drums. So there's just the CLA. And then I still have our original signal coming through for maybe like the sound of the room or the last tail bit of our kick drum here. Um, but we can see I'm EQing an incredible amount of things out of this sound. And this is maybe, uh oh, my lighting might just change. Uh, <laughs> lights are going out in my apartment. Um, uh, and so this might actually cause us some problems. Like if I were to play this kick drum together and change our balance of these two different uh, signals here, 
sorry for the popping. That's my audio router. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really hearing it. I was I was listening for phasing. You know, it's almost like a chorusing effect or a flanging effect. But sometimes when you make a change to the same sound um, and then layer it with itself, but with a different change on it, you run into some phasing issues. Um, for the most part, I've had a pretty easy time of running this tool in parallel. But every now and then you might run into an issue like that if you're using something else. Um, so that's just a little bit of, you know, I, I, this is a poor term, but I like to call this audio rehabilitation, right? I'm kind of taking a sample that was maybe recorded, you know, with, you know, maybe a little improperly or just not with enough equipment to be nice and full and ready for our music and uh, giving it a little bit more via EQing saturation compression. Then we have some other crazy EQs going on over here. Now, this is this is very much like me uh, in my old days doing these really, really heavy EQ uh, shapes like this and now I mean if it sounds good then you're fine right like I've, I've mentioned this many times just listen to your ears follow what your ears say if it sounds good don't worry about it um, personally moving forward now I would probably be looking for alternative ways of achieving whatever this EQ is doing for me with other audio effects like saturators compressors other types of filters but we can hear without and then with we're in two very different places, right? This feels a lot more like a hip hop drum. I'm accenting the the kind of tonal sub note that this kick resonates at and also the clickier high frequencies of this, but all of this mid stuff that kind of represents the sound of the room like you get when you record a kick drum is being scooped out. And so this makes a kick drum feel a lot more electronic even though I'm using a drum machine kick drum and a live acoustic recorded kick drum. So that's kind of the acoustic electronic blending, a little bit of what we were talking about uh, in my last stream. I think that was my last stream. Um, and then another EQ because, you know, more <laughs> more of the same stuff. I, it looks like I went a little too hard with this uh, bell shape. And so I'm cutting away from some more specific frequencies there that maybe cause some problems. Scooping out even more mids because I'm a little crazy. Um, I could probably pull the scale back on one of these. Or up. Right, you can hear how this gives me very different varieties of drums. I don't know, I think it was fine where it was. Maybe 90. We'll pull it back a little bit. We'll bring some of the mids back, but very, very little. Remember how powerful this Ableton EQ is. I've mentioned this before. This band number four is down almost, it's nine whole decibels. Like that's that's an incredible amount of reduction there on that frequency. Um, but otherwise, that's just me preparing my kick drum to be ran through the uh, drum group, which is kind of a little bit more of the same. And one thing I want to note about this multi-tool is I have switches on the left here. So kick, snare, toms, overheads, room, and cowbell. So I can change the way that this is going to affect the signal based on what you know it thinks I'm going to want based on these different instruments so that's why you might see this in multiple locations here the kick for me is a bit colored more skin sound I don't understand the more skin sound kick, kick for me is a bit colored so that to me a bit colored means a little bit too distorted um, so for me that's probably the stuff going on on the group not necessarily the not necessarily the actual track here but it might also just have to do with the individual samples I picked originally uh, don't forget that we are hearing the kick on a filter here so in the beginning we're filtered down and then later on we come up you can hear this so yeah it's kind of interesting because in context it doesn't necessarily sound so acoustic but um, in practice it is so let's move on to our snare. Um, once again, you can see I have some pretty heavy EQ shapes. Not a little, not as crazy, but I think this is happening because once again, I'm layering electronic and acoustic sounds all on top of each other. And you can see if I go into my MIDI here, the balance is, you know, sort of close on some of these. Whoops, let me turn this on here. Right, so those three together. But then this one's very quiet. So the tail sound, that very squashed, heavily compressed snare on top here, that's quiet because that's just meant to kind of mimic the, you know, the reverb or the splash of the rest of these snares played together. Uh, now you can tell there's a tom in here, like a very 80s tom. And that's very important to the way that this snare drum ends up feeling in the end. But there is another layer in the channel below here that kind of blends into the snare and is part of it as well. Um, so if we go through what I'm doing here, I'm actually accenting that tonal aspect of that snare. So this one here the tom excuse me we can see i have a peak 
a pretty sharp one on that resonant. Now, again, this is something I used to do back in the old days. It's like, oh, it's the it's this part of the sound I want. Just crank it up. Well, we don't necessarily need to do that so much. Maybe I'll pull this down a bit. We could we could achieve that later on in a less exaggerated way. But again, it's kind of OK. And then once again, we have our multi tool. I'm not going to run through that again, but we're on snare mode here, which is going to change the EQ uh, placements and also some of the parameters on the other audio uh, multi tool effects there. So that's that's our snare group. I don't think we're really changing this throughout the song. This is what it sounds like all together. Very resonant. Doom, doom. You can kind of tell uh, what pitch is being played here. And then we have what's called hats, but I'm going to rename this to toms. Toms. So this is like an electronic tom sound, right? I have a few of them. These come from drum racks, and they have a lot of built-in reverb on them. I don't think that's coming from my track, but I kept it. It's fine. It helps kind of separate this sound from the other drums. Maybe makes this feel a little bit more like an instrument than it does a actual drum sound. Um, and really, there's just really sharp high end in these sounds that it looks like I was cutting out with uh, peaks here, which is pretty common in drum machine, like recorded drum machine drums, like very, very bright, especially with that saturation going. And then I'm cutting out the sub because I don't want these to like infringe upon what my kick drum is doing and the frequencies that that's filling up. And I probably have some of these toms hitting on both my snare and my kick drum. So I don't want that to conflict with the resonant note coming from my drum there and so i think this was an okay move it's a pretty sharp cut but maybe we could have used a shelf regardless it's fine and you can hear how with the snare this kind of adds part of that tonality right and once again when i zoom in on these and play them by themselves they feel a lot more organic than they sound when we're playing this whole thing uh, in context with all the other synths and then this track down here labeled perks is more it's kind of like just an acoustic hi-hat or acoustic drum kit with no kick drum right so we have three different hi-hat sounds that i'm using that are all organic sounds we have a cross stick here which is very organic so there's even more kind of quiet tail for our, our snare in the end and then a ride i'm um, filling that in also pretty organic sounding so all together our drums are pretty organic, right? It's not doesn't feel like somebody's playing a drum kit because it's got that robotic rhythmic perfection that I mentioned we don't want in certain instances. But in this instance where I'm using very organic sounds anyway, I think we can get away with it. It helps this feel kind of like, dare I say it, disco a little bit, just a little bit. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so that's all of our individual drum tracks. And then all of these are going to run into our CLA drums, but it's on the room setting. So if I solo this channel here, whoops. You can hear it's kind of like the stereo field in the background. I'm kind of acting like this is a room microphone that's then blended into the individual mics of the drums, which is stronger here in this unprocessed version of the chain. This is then running into a preamp. Well, channel strip preamp. I think this thing is built off of the Neve preamps. It's kind of what it looks like, right? Um, and so we have a bit of an EQ over here on the left. I'm only engaging the high and the low frequencies. Uh, low pass filter is off because of our kick drum. We don't want to cut out the, the sub part of our kick um, maybe a little bit of coloring going on from this tool just because it's based on an old analog piece of hardware uh, but this is just kind of doing more drum uh, grouping looks like I've split the left and the right here so this is making this feel even more natural and recorded by having a little bit of low end heavier on the left a little bit of high end heavier on the right it's actually not really something I noticed so much in my headphones so maybe I was doing this to compensate for some of the samples that I was using and then this is probably going to be our de-esser. Yeah, this is my favorite de-esser tool ever made, and I don't think it's easy to get anymore if you didn't already own it. It's such a shame. Isotope, if you're watching, release this as a free legacy plugin. I will I'll give you all the money in the world. All right, anyway. So <clears throat> that's just cutting out some of the harsher high frequencies in our drum sounds here, right? So all together, do the drums feel coherent? Not bad. One thing that I'm hearing that we could maybe do to help this out a little bit is the reverb on this toms are really intense. So maybe we could go into these samples here and add a little bit of a fade out here so that they don't sound nearly as roomy. Well, this one has a bit. Um, this one looks like I was already doing it a little bit too. So don't sound necessarily as roomy as they did before. Which I think is going to help. This one's a little too, too much. So we'll increase that. And then adding a very, very subtle reverb to the whole drum group in general is really going to help, you know, because these are all different samples, layered drum machine sounds and non-drum machine sounds. Some of the samples have reverb in them, some of them don't. And so adding like a small layer of reverb here, I think is really going to help these feel like they're all coming from the same place. 
Um, and now I'm going to use some third party tools, you know, might as well, we're, we're streaming. I don't want to just repeat what I, what I demonstrate to my students in class. I want to show off some things sometimes. Uh, so I love the sound toys stuff. I think it's some of the greatest gear out there. Um, and so this little plate reverb is going to work fine for us. We want a very short reverb because we're mimicking the sound of a room. Um, I'm going to cut the low frequencies out of here. Here's a note about sound toys tools. Some people don't know. Uh, let me close and reopen this. So we see how this knob says low cut and there's no other not like numbers here. Like I couldn't tell you what frequency this low cut is set to. If we right click on this knob, if there's a number to display, it will show it. So we can see the mix too. We got hundred percent now. So if I right click, I actually get the numbers on the tool. So for those of us who have this tool, see seconds here, we can actually get a very particular time. Just right click on them and then you'll get your actual <laughs> parameters shown. Like I don't understand why that's the secondary option, not the main option, but you know, saving space, I guess. Why not? Making things making things feel analog and old school. So there you go. That's kind of a little trick. So we can make sure that we're keeping this around like I don't know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, something like a short, short, short plate or room reverb. Um, and then cutting out sub frequencies so that we don't get any strange uh, phase cancellation going on, which I've talked about in our other streams here. So somewhere around 100 is probably safe. And then we really want to walk this reverb back a lot. Right, that's like an insane amount of reverb here. So we're going to pull this back basically down to zero and increase it until I can hear it and then walk it back a little further. Honestly, about 2.5% seems good for me. And I'm gonna even bring our high cut or sorry, our high pass filter up a little bit here to cut even more of those kind of rumbly frequencies out. We have a very boom, boom, resonant Tom snare drum combo. So I don't want that to hit uh, this as much. And then we're a little long. So maybe about 0.6 seconds is going to be better for us. Lovely. I'm going to move this to the beginning of our chain. I want this to be kind of incorporated into uh, the rest of our chain here. I want the compressor from the multi-tool to actually capture the reverb. Similarly, I want the EQ uh, from the console to color the reverb too. Cool. Whoa. This is what we sound like with our filter. So that should help glue things together a little bit here as well. So. <clears throat> I think that's going to be a nice improvement to our drums. I'm going to take a look at this de and see if it's squashing it too much. See if we can maybe walk it back a bit. I think this is okay. We can hear the frequencies I'm focusing on here. It's just that kind of you know, telephone high frequency sounds. So that's nice. I think we're going to leave that for now. I don't want to do too much in a vacuum, right? We want some sort of context here when we're changing some of these sounds around. So now I'm going to leave our drums and bring in our bass. And I'm playing a very high frequency note up here. Let me skip down. Skipping between octaves. And you can see I'm doing these volume cuts to make sure that any bleed from the release of our bass sound here doesn't end up in this little space that I'm doing these kind of sharp pauses in. That really helps it be like sudden and kind of cut through be very uh, noticeable. So you can see progressive wise on the bass line, I start with one note up high, playing the same note, and then I drop it down an octave while adding some, some octave shifts here. And then later on, we start adding some lower notes to start introducing a bit of a melody into the bass line. Long note. That's probably got a pitch bend on it too as well, if I could assume. Yep, there we go. You can see the pitch bend up. So it's kind of like somebody sliding up the fret of a bass guitar, right? Kind of meant to simulate that because I'm using a synth bass here, but I want this to sound, you know, pretty organic. If we listen to our drums, you know, I'm kind of headed that direction. Uh, looks like we have some volume automations going on on the track itself. I don't do this anymore. I really don't recommend you do volume automations on the track itself because then when I go back in the mixing process, I have to do wonky things like go into a bass group and add a utility tool with a gain knob at the beginning of our chain. I can't just put this in a group and crank the chain knob up here uh, because that's going to still give us the same input volume on the group if I wanted to add more effects to the sound. Likewise, if I wanted to add more effects to the original channel itself, look at the volume of the output of this trash. Right? We are 
right at the top there. I have no more headroom to add any sort of uh, you know, saturation compression tools, things like that, uh, to the end of this chain. So this was a mistake. My signal flow here is poor, um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we're definitely missing some uh, plugins for this sound that are you know of the old, like some free tools that are no longer compatible with my computer, um, and. So we're going to have to just kind of, you know, rethink this one a little bit. And I think the way that we're going to do that is by taking a look at the saturator right here, because uh, the saturator is what is going to give us control over, you know, the extra harmonics in the signal. The other audio effects I have on here are providing, well, width. So this is a cabinet tool, which gives it a little bit of a stereo presence, which is why I'm cutting out the sub frequency here. We don't want to phase cancel. And then we have our raw low frequency down here. So this bit you can hear just higher frequencies don't really carry resonance and then the actual pure sub together makes this a little bit more present in the headphones and in a stereo field uh this is just a kind of like a bass preamp and so it's just gonna basically function like an eq that does a little bit of coloring this is saturation but i'm barely using any of it i know it looks like a little crazy here but it's mostly just changing our relative volume here and then this saturator is also doing very little we can see our our orange line here doesn't quite meet the middle here which is means we're not going to get too much clipping or anything so if i wanted to see about maybe adding some harmonics to this making it more present without messing with my uh volume knobs here maybe we turn our soft clip on and drive this a bit until we're happy with the amount of you know distortion or saturation being applied to the signal um, and then we want to use our output knob here to kind of fix the relative volume of this chain in general right the saturator is used to having an output be way above zero because it's a clipper right we can use this to distort sounds and so that's why we have our output knob here it's kind of the perfect candidate to create a better balance so I'm gonna go about negative 12 decibels down I want a lot of headroom here especially for this third saturator tool I'm using saturators everywhere sort of subtly here uh, is no longer going to add as much distortion here because now relatively our volumes are a bit quieter and now I don't need to have my volume automations here be so quiet now the problem with this is if I were to like highlight everything here and move it up you can see these areas where I have cuts move up too and so relatively, there's not a very easy way for me to uh, fix this because of my volume automations here. Realistically, I should be going through and replacing these with some other means, right? Like even automating the on off of this entire track is probably going to be a better means of doing that than these volume automations. So I'm going to undo this change. I'm going to try and undo this change. Okay, there we go. Um, and we're going to kind of keep the, the, the band-aid fix that I had here, but you know, that would be an important place where my, uh, signal chain is just not very well thought out, right? I was probably speed running this a little bit. And so, you know, we wind up with some funky stuff like that. I just want to make sure that where our bass is the loudest, which is kind of in our chorus section here, I'm not causing any problems with our kick drum, right? The kick drum and the bass are going to kind of share a very similar relationship. And so I want to make sure that they sound good where everything is the loudest and fullest. So I was able to turn the bass up loud enough to hear it quite balanced in my headphones, but I can hear that the kick drum is unaffected. And part of the reason for that is because we have this side chain going here that's very, very strong, right? So I have this hooked up to our, our drum rack that has our kick drums in it. And then from that drum rack, I've created a little side chain click with an operator. So it's a one millisecond sound. So it's the shortest sound I can possibly make. And that's what's causing uh, my compressor to function here. Cranked my ratio up and my threshold all the way down. So this is a pretty absolute compressor or an absolute side chain. And I have my release turned quite high, which you can see this orange bar here represents how long it takes my bass to kind of come up to full volume each time a kick drum hits. And that's like pulsing. That's a pulsing speed that you can actually feel in here. And so it's scooping my bass out of the way of my kick drum for plenty of time for the resonance of my kick drum to complete uh, before the bass kind of swells to fill its space. Um, so that's going to be kind of like a nice way to treat that. Um, check out in the chat right now because our uh, 343 Labs account is posting about our giveaway. I think this week it's a Arturia plugin of your choice. Of your choice? Yeah, of choice. Um, it seems like it's an Arturia FX plugin, so not just anything. You can't grab pigments today. Um, but there are some really cool Arturia effects out there. You know, while we're here, look at that. I got the Arturia stuff pulled up 
let's see what would i tell you to pick if you won um i really like the chorus effect which is i don't know what it's called anymore chorus june 6 like the juno chorus effect is really cool um i think that's really nice i actually don't have as many of their effects as i thought i did that might be one of the only ones i got well there you go that's my suggestions or chorus june 6 i gotta believe that's probably on the list uh it's a cool kind of like the roland dimension tool from back in the day with just the four buttons on it that give you different chorusing effects sounds really nice and organic uh so yeah, there you go. a little reminder a little reminder there <clears throat> oh uh oh message retracted hopefully that's not incorrect we'll see <laughs> i'm sure keep your eye on the chat they'll let you know they'll let you know um, all right, I'm not using my time very well. Let's let's um, let's move on from this. So the bass has been dealt with. The mix was totally totally quiet, and the saturation wasn't enough, so we wouldn't be able to hear it on smaller speakers. Um, cool. So there you go. Um, yeah, I don't know. Three four three labs. I think that's probably Thomas. Thomas, I don't know if you meant to remove that message, but we can't see it anymore. Um, but yeah, there you go. He's letting you know that John will announce the winners during his stream. So don't forget to sign up for that one before then. Uh, cool. Moving on to our next synth. So I'm going to keep adding these in in a row so we can kind of use that added context to make some of these changes here. And we have a super filtered kind of synth piano sound, right? And because it's so filtered, we have very sharp, you know, harmonics going on here. If I were to take the uh, guitar rig, or sorry, not guitar, the guitar tool off that's doing this i think it's this guy this phaser uh what we'll notice is we get a lot more of those frequencies back right kind of sounds like a full synth again it's actually kind of nice but sonically i really was wanting that uh harmonic kind of like telephone filter effect um and so that's what we're achieving with this but because of that it really makes some of the frequencies in this sound kind of sharp and harsh and so i was doing my best to clean them up with an eq back in the day but this eq is kind of atrocious this is helping contribute to that filter uh and it's not really achieving the goal we need and so what we're going to do is play through some of this piano sound look at the eq and determine times that it gets too harsh and sharp in our headphones and then make a bit of a cut there uh probably a stronger cut than we have going on here so these ones, very sharp. See the ones right next to it as well. So I know this looks pretty extreme, but what this is gonna allow us to do is turn this instrument up immediately after this right we're taking some of the loudest elements of this sound and we're really cutting away from them in a pretty sharp way um <clears throat> but we're able to now turn this whole thing up now that we've kind of reduced these super harsh frequencies now i don't need know if i need to again we want to turn our bass and drums on for context for that one I think it's probably okay maybe we'll do a small amount like point something not a whole not a whole decibel but somewhere around there and honestly uh this synth has so many effects on it i don't think we need to do anything to make this cut through the mix anymore so we're just going to leave that one as is um we did turn it down on the track a little bit there as well so now we have these uh keyboard layers so this one here is kind of like a building arpeggio it's got a lot of distortion on it you can see we have a raw which i think is mimicking the uh the rat this is like a guitar distortion pedal here. If I turn this off, you can hear what the original sound I recorded was. It's just an electric piano. So we have a couple rounds of distortion and saturation here that really helped this kind of become a bright sort of synth-like instrument. But once again, no synths here. You know, recall my electronic acoustic blending uh stream you know i'm using a lot of organic sounds here but in an electronic way that make it end up feeling kind of like a synth um and so that is honestly doing fine i think maybe it's just a little quiet so we'll keep our eye on this one here you can see i'm cutting out the low frequencies especially because i'm driving a distortion unit and a saturator a lot like this i think that's probably a smart thing because that would generate a lot of noisiness down there um, and then our other sound here i think is just like a nice electric piano layer <laughs> Cool. You can see I'm playing with a low pass, or sorry, a high pass filter here to make the bass and the uh, 
e-piano here blend together quite nicely. So if we look at what this is doing, this is not it. Where's my EQ? There we go. <laughs> if we look at what this is doing, you can see when the e-piano plays by itself, it's allowed to have its more sub frequencies. And then the second it jumps into the chorus bit where I have a lot more sounds join it, it becomes a little thinner, right? It loses some of those lower harmonics. That's because a lot of the other sounds have those already. And I don't want to clog that area up at all. So that helps this like stand kind of, you know, big and strong in this one moment and then is joined by other things to help kind of make that feel bigger. So you can see the volume on this one has probably been turned up. Yep, 4.25 decibels versus 0.8, right? So we're cranking the volume on this when it stands alone as well. Um, so that's helping. You can also probably hear there's a pitch automation to help this kind of sweep into um, the new part, which I think is actually a really good uh, like arrangement decision here as well. So we can hear it. So this is the context we have right now. And I actually think this synth's a little loud, so we'll turn it down a bit. And I think it could be put further in the background. Like it's very like clean and there's other things going on top of this that I really want to stand on top like this uh, guitar that we're going to get to very shortly. And so I'm going to add, you know what, while we're here, let's add that Arturia plugin. This is totally an advertisement. This is insane. <laughs> they don't pay me. There we go. They do call me and check up on me sometimes though. See how I'm doing. I do appreciate them for that. All right. <clears throat> so we can hear this now is a lot more swimmy but also a lot more in the background so that's not going to cover up the rest of what's going on here so we could maybe mess around with these parameters here a little bit i really like this just because uh there's so little here it's kind of easier to use right we have one two or both can increase or slow down the rate the amount of phase here and the position which is also very handy because you can kind of take deeper control over it here but honestly just in its kind of subtle default position is going to be good for what we're doing here so let's hear this in context one more time and then without It feels a lot more space. It doesn't feel as alone and small in the middle. And we don't hear nearly as much of that natural room reverb that makes this feel way more recorded than synth-like. So that's really going to help that kind of blend in with the rest of what we got going on here. Now let's look at the group and there's nothing on this group. Looks like we have some side chains going on here. Are they the same settings? They are. So we're actually gonna copy these, delete them from the individual tracks and put them on the group. It's always kind of a good habit to have your sidechain be fairly close to the end in the chain. Now I just want to look at what this looks like on an EQ at the end. Looking good. Just wanted to make sure we're not seeing too much stuff down here. You know, we don't have to sit here and cut our sub out all the time. Like that's kind of, you know, a wives tale. Uh, it's not true that that's always going to give you problems, but sometimes it does. So it's good to keep an eye on it. Uh, cool, so that's our key layers, you know, just background synths, you don't need to spend too much time on them. And then we have a variety of different sounds in this 80s synth group that are getting covered up and not getting enough attention. So I think we're going to get good use out of some saturation on some different effects here. And these are mostly here for like the chorus and the bridge. And so those are the two parts that need to be spruced up anyway. So I think these are the instruments that were left, you know, left alone a little bit, needed some, needed some help. So we can hear all together. We have this, which is the synth from my keyboard, with some effects on it. So I don't really need to go crazy on the effects there. It's already very kind of thinned out and small, almost old school sounding. But then we have this thing, which is meant to be the hi-fi layer. And I don't really hear this happening in the, the song very much. So we're going to want to try and find a way to make this a lot more present. You know, step one is turn it up, but here we are again with me putting automation on our volume here. It's only in a couple parts of the song, so I could replace that, but it's just to avoid the annoyance, I'm going to use the gain knob, which I'm already doing. In fact, no, I'm gonna use the utility knob here uh, to adjust the volume. This is bad habits, so try to avoid doing this. This is why we're going through this track.
cool. So that made it more present, but it's sitting in kind of the middle, and that's where a lot of our other instruments are. So I'm going to want to add some stereo presence to this to actually move it out of the way, or I could add some auto panning so it goes left and right, but I think to me that's going to be too distracting for this. So I'm going to add a delay tool here, um, and I'm going to use this one just because everyone's got it. Everyone's got some variation of this, so it's pretty easy to find. Um, put this before our saturation. Oh, sorry, our compression, excuse me, which is our side chain. And we're going to turn off the link function here so that we get unique control over the left and the right speaker. Reduce these to one millisecond for now. Reduce our feedback to nothing. Turn our filter off so we're not actually filtering our sound. And dry wet goes to 100%. So now this is essentially just a track delay split in the left and the right speaker. And I can increase one of these somewhere around 20 milliseconds. That's kind of the sweet spot for... Uh, making something feel wide but still feel like one thing and not not being so close that you get this like kind of flanging effect when converted back to mono so we'll play this and see if this helps kind of push this synth out of the way of the pad beneath it i can turn it up now more Cool, so that really helps it feel like it's further away from the other instruments, right? If we can imagine like this being performed by LCD sound system, right? They got 15 members on stage and they're all in different locations. This would probably be some synth player in the far back who's not doing something nearly as paramount to, you know, the song, but is still contributing this nice layer. Um, and so that kind of stereo wideness helps do that sort of effect to it. Depending on what type of sound we add that stereo presence to, it can kind of go one or the other way. Doing it to a voice oftentimes makes it more noticeable, like more present, and then doing it to a pad oftentimes pushes it further in the back. Uh, so just use your ears to kind of decide you know, what you think is best there. And now we can also hear that together, these two sounds no longer feel like one synth, but two different synths. Which is great. I think this synth is not bright enough though, so it's going to look a little weird for me to have these EQs cutting a lot out and then throwing some saturation on here, but I think it's necessary, and I'm going to use my favorite tool. This one you can still get. This is not a legacy tool. I think it's only like 100 bucks right now, but always goes on sale. Uh, it's Trash 2. It's a multi-tool by Isotope. We got Filter 1, which is an EQ. Trash, which is our multi-band saturator. Another EQ here. Convolution, which is that stereo separation I was talking about earlier, but also functions kind of like a convolution impulse response filter. Uh, dynamics, multiband dynamic tool, and an echo delay tool. But we're just using our trash tool here. If I click multiband, I can add saturation to higher frequencies different from the mids. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to kind of split this up into two different uh, sets of saturation to help help make this feel better. Set your amount by increasing the gain here and then the drive. And then balance the effect with our mix knob. I don't want too much. I don't want this to overwhelm other sounds. Maybe a little bit on the mids here to balance it out a bit. Turn it way down. Nice. So we can hear without. And then with. So in a sense, I'm listening to this like it's a really chill version of the music sounds better with you. I don't actually know what you're referring to there, Simple Sam. Music sounds better with you. It's probably a song, right? It's probably a song I haven't heard. <clears throat> Trash too often on sale. Yes, yeah. Isotope loves to put their stuff on sale. They also have a subscription model. I'm not the biggest fan of music gear following a subscription model because it makes it less accessible to a lot of people. But eh, it's it's cool. It's cool. Um, cool. So now we only have our bridge pads to kind of look at. We kind of took care of these by adding a little bit of saturation back to it. Let's hear this in context. That feels a lot bigger now, which will hopefully help the intro and the drop feel more dynamically, you know, different from each other. And then we have our bridge synths, which have next to no audio effects on them, which is fine. I'm going to group these together so that we can add the same sort of trash to both of these. I think these were just kind of missed when it comes to some of the processing. There we go. 
know, that will help that fill space as well. And this synth that has absolutely nothing on it is gonna get the same wideness we added to this filter wah synth because it's meant to be a layer. I'm not even hearing it, but we're gonna copy our delay down and switch the order, right? So instead of the right speaker being the one that's delayed, we're gonna make it the left speaker here. And while I'm here, I might as well throw an EQ on here, cut away from some of the frequencies I hear we don't like. This is very present here in the middle. Might end up getting in the way of something. So maybe a little dip here. Shelf some of this low end away. It's kind of rumbly, especially with the echo. So it might just be a little extra. And then this stuff, look at all this. Ooh, crunchy, crunchy high frequencies that we don't hear in the song. So they're not really doing much for us. So let's pull those away a little bit. In fact, if we wanted to, I could even just cut them away. And I'm, I'm actually kind of okay with that. If we wanted to go crazy, we had to cut all of them away. But I think some of them are okay. I like the little bit crush effect. So that should help a little bit as well. So without our change, we have a very dry delayed piano. Then with a little bit softer in the background. So that'll hopefully take up a little bit less space. Means we can also probably turn it up a little bit. Now that we cranked the gain on everything via our trash here, we also might just turn this in general down. And now we'll add our group EQ, which is just gonna do any sort of final balancing between this pads and the rest of the song. A little loud. Simple Sam, if I heard this song, I'd probably remember it, but like keeping song names in my brain, there's just too many. I'm so bad at it. Um, plug and Boutique has some great sale, free plugins with purchase. I think it got trash for nine bucks. That's that's a really good price for trash. <laughs> I think I paid 30 uh, during like a Cyber Cyber Monday bundle thing. All right, Cyber Monday's coming up, so keep your eyes open on that stuff for sure. You'll definitely get a lot of really great gear for the low, low. All right. Cool, so now we're onto our clav layer. Similar to the, the key layers here, this is just kind of like some background um, counter melody stuff. So we'll see how much we need to really do to this. But we have two different things here. We have an e-piano, which is our kind of like main wah piano that's holding down the intro and the beginning of the song. Honestly, I think this instrument by itself sounds really great. I don't think we need to do too much to this. Just maybe mix it in a little bit better with our volume, a little loud. It's also a little heavy on the right, and I want this thing to really fill the space evenly. So I'm going to pan this to the left a little bit, but lo and behold, I've got automations going on on our panning here, which is always happening. It's always a mess. So utility tool is going to come in handy here. It has a panning feature on it as well, so I can do that from here. Just a little bit. Just a little even. Cool. So it's still a little bit in the right, which is fine, because the clav is going to balance it out down here. Um, but yeah, that's that's going to help this feel a little bit more even. And then we'll look at the clav, which is this instrument, right? I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with this type of thing. Yeah, so there you go. There's our little clav sound. And it's pretty quiet in the background. So I think we have a lot of room to make this shine a bit. What? We don't want it to get too in the way because we do have a important guitar coming in next. So... Just turn it up a little bit. Cool. All right. So this is feeling a lot more put together and dynamic already. So we'll just leave that layer for now. And now next is the last tonal in instrument. It's this stack of kind of guitar pluck recordings. And this is kind of meant to be our lead, right? This is kind of playing like the main melody of the song since we don't have a vocal in it. And so I'm actually going to hold off on that real quick and hit the last two sounds here um, because this is the one that really needs to sit on top. So we have this harmonic guitar layer. Here we have these guitar harmonics, some of which are going forward, some of which are going reverse. 
have a lot of heavy delays going on here. There's a lot of audio effects on this. So it's really big. It's really all over the place. Really mainly, I think we just need a little bit of reverb to help this feel kind of even in the space it's in. And for something like this, I really like the Valhalla Vintage Verb, another one of those plugins that goes on sale for like 20 bucks, 10 bucks. It's really great. So we're going to let this be a little nicer here. Okay, bit of a bigger reverb. And then um, we have some panning things going on here. I don't know, we also have some frequency problems here, which we want to do before the, the, the reverb, right? Some really noisy, bright stuff up here. Not super helpful. And we don't want any of these super low frequencies to resonate too much. So maybe we'll find a problem one. Okay, down here a little bit. So we'll just dip it a tiny bit. There you go. So that will help a fair amount. Let's make sure that our volume is nice and relative in context. Maybe actually a little louder, just a little bit. A few, de few points of decibels, not even a whole decibel, but almost there. All right, cool. So. Everything so far has been mixed in pretty well. We just have some audio effects left, which aren't much, right? We have our wind effects down here, which is just kind of okay, we have a there, which is a weird place for that. I probably put that in the wrong spot. And then we have just a bunch of ah, uh, this stuff. Right? This is really quiet, so we definitely want to be able to hear that. So let's turn this up. In fact, let's highlight all of it and turn it all up. Wait, you're saying Valhalla doesn't do sales? I swear I did not pay full price for Vintage Verb. That's their whole thing. Wow, maybe I'm thinking of something else. But, I mean, it's still only 50 bucks at full price, right? So it's not so bad. Um, there we go. So now we can hear the wind a little better without messing with our swoops and swishes. These guys, which are... To be honest with you, a little quiet. So maybe we'll crank these up about a volume, a decibel or two. A little better. Okay, we've got some small sounds over here. These are just little sound effects. Want to make sure they're blended nicely. Whoa. Oh, that's a it's a sub bass layer. I don't really know what it's doing in here. Let's move that on up to our bass group where it belongs. Why well, now it's too loud, so we gotta fix that. There we go. Very interesting. That's in the right spot now. And honestly, it's it's very loud and present, so we don't really need to mess with that. What's this guy here? Okay, that's fine. Maybe a little louder. Kind of sounds like a tire screech. And then we have just some reverse sounds here. So we need to add a little bit of a uh, fade in, right? That starts right away. We don't want that. We want that to kind of be natural. So let me go to the other one as well. Fade it in a bit and make sure that these are loud enough. A little louder. And also, no reverb on this question mark, so we're going to add one. And I want this to be a bright reverb, so if I'm going to use something like Vintage, I want to probably switch this coloring to Now, which is going to give me a lot more high end in this sound. There we go. Great, looking great. So now I think we are safe to move on to this lead guitar because this needs the most help, and it's kind of supposed to be our main element, right? So right now it's very quiet. And it shows up the beginning a little bit. But it's still just so quiet. So first thing I'm gonna do is add a compressor to this whole channel. And we're going to make sure that this uh, <laughs> relative volume of this guitar is kind of fixed for what we're doing here. So we'll add our, we'll just use a glue compressor for this one to this middle channel. You can see we have a lot of discrepancies in volume here, some of which are intentional, some of which seem to be not, so we'll fix those. 
and I'm not really doing anything to the settings here. I'm just making sure that this is engaged at the quieter moment and then increase our makeup gain a little bit. Hopefully I'll be able to hear this better. A little better, but we'll just turn up the volume of it anyway while we're here. Cool. Now, I think the main thing that we're going to struggle with here, other than the fact that I have clipping audio being sent into a variety of different things here, uh, is just the general tonality of this guitar. If I play all of this together, even in its most exciting point, it's just a pretty clean guitar. It sounds super compressed, very clicky, like I messed that up. I don't know, the recording was poor, right? So there's a few things we need to do to fix this. So step one is see what we can do about that clicking. So we're going to grab a glue compressor and lower that attack all the way down to 0.01. Uh, it's going to make sure that anything it captures doesn't really let any bleed through. And we can hear that some of these pops and clicks now are a little bit less intense. If I felt like I needed to do more, I could use like one of these click remover tools that people sell like the RX D-Click tool from Isotope, more Isotope stuff. This is so CPU intensive, mind you, so be careful with something like this, but you'll notice as I play through this, look at where it says clicks repaired. And you can hear it's so much cleaner now. So if that's the type of guitar I was looking for, that would probably be the move that I'm looking for. But if I'm looking to add some saturation, ooh, I hit a button. Uh-oh, good thing I, I'm watching myself. Um, so yeah, if I'm trying to you know, add a little bit of saturation to this, um, then, you know, that's going to impact that little pop or that little pop is going to impact how that sounds. And I might want that. I might not. So maybe I'll do that afterwards. Uh, but we do want to add something to give this a little bit of grit. And now it's kind of up to me how I go about doing this. I can certainly do this with trash. I can do this with any of the other audio effects, but, um, you know, the Ableton amp is also going to work, you know, no problem for us. So I'm going to choose amp and then I'm going to choose trash because I think I'm going to let I'm going to be able to make trash feel a lot more like a synth than the amp. Um, but we can still see what the amp would do for us in this situation. So let me put this on the other side of our compressor. So right away, you can hear it definitely feels like it's coming through an amp. And some of that clicking is not as bad. I'm going to turn this into dual mode. So I definitely have some panning going on here. And then presence and treble need to come way down, right? We're already saturating and boosting the high frequencies of this guitar so much that the amp doesn't need to be doing that at all, right? And then how much drive do we really want? Right, something maybe a little bit more rock inspired like that. Let's hear what this sounds like in context. Yeah, so Simple Sam was saying he was using RX elements today, like the super basic one, and it just like completely flattened his computer. That's something you should expect from some of the Isotope stuff, but especially RX. RX is something that like, I, and you know, I might be a little bit incorrect here, but it's like audio forensic tools, right? Like investigators can use these tools to like scrub audio in like a criminal investigation and things like that. Like it's it's a little bit intense, and sometimes they're expecting you to have a supercomputer. But even still, like this, uh, the denoise features here, so spectral denoise. You see, there's an audio slider on this tool, like A, B, C, and D. I have a supercomputer. I'll, I'll, I, I'm safe to tell you, my my computer is pretty serious, and this thing on best quality immediately. If I hit spacebar. You can see I'm, I'm pushing pretty heavy CPU stuff here. So it's just, it's their tools. Like you gotta, you gotta kind of work with them here, but that's why freezing and flattening is really handy, right? Cause even if a tool is not really capable of running on your computer, if we can hear it enough to make sure we're making the right changes, then we can just freeze and flatten it right into a new piece of audio and clear up, you know, that CPU space. Uh, for ourselves so there you go that was the sound of the amp on our guitar i don't think that's going to give us the right sound i could also use like a guitar amp modeler right so that multi-tool i was using before has the same thing for guitars i could slap cla guitar on here and choose you know different amp styles like this clean crunch heavy <laughs> You 
here. That's getting me, you know, way too far. And so that's why I really like using trash in this kind of instance. One, this is meant to sound kind of like a synthy song anyway. So turning this guitar into a synth, uh, you know, is going to be easier with something like trash. But it just gives me a really, really particular control over how much distortion and where. Um, so that's going to be really nice to do. So let me turn on our multiband mode here. Maybe we could say we want most of our distortion coming from the mids, and I'll let the high frequencies just be a bit of a normal boost. Because this is the click and the pop, we don't necessarily even really want that. But this one, if I drive it a lot, listen to how this sounds. I'm going to preemptively turn my mix down so it doesn't blow our ears out. So you can hear we're getting kind of close to some distortion, and if I increase the drive here... Not only is it nice kind of clean distortion, but because of the fact that I have to walk this mix down an incredible amount, otherwise it's just loud. All right, that's way too much. We get this nice blend between the original sort of like just regular uh, clean amped guitar and this more sort of distorted signal. So think of this kind of like using a guitar pedal, right? You click off your guitar pedal for the intro stuff and you click it back on uh, for the more intense stuff. So we're going to do something very similar. We're just going to automate the uh, on off switch here for um, our, uh, um, sorry, for our uh, mid band saturator, or we could honestly just automate the on off switch for the trash as a whole, but I do kind of want to leave this high end running. So there's a few different ways I could, I could do the mix here. I could do the bypass knob here. I could just do the on off switch. So I think on off switch is probably going to be the easiest thing for me here. You can see trash on off switch is something that we have access to here. It's a little weird because for trash off is up and vice versa. So on means down, up means off, which is definitely the opposite of what we're used to here. Um, but what this allows me to do is only use this distorted guitar in certain sections of the song, like this chorus here, right? <laughs> And then going back to a clean guitar here. I mean, I could keep this distorted, but it might be out of context, right? It might be a little bit too much. Right, that makes that feel like it's meant to be getting even more intense, and it's not. We're meant to kind of pull back to where we were before here. Now, volume-wise, this does cause me problems, and that's probably why you see me doing these really crazy things like turning this up seven, even though that forces this to clip the signal. It's not not good move. I should really be turning this down and balancing my, my inputs better. Um, but I might need to do some sort of automation similar to that to make sure that in the moments where we don't have that device on, you know, the saturation, we turn this up a bit because otherwise it's not going to come through the mix. <laughs> here as well. So here's just too quiet. Let's so just let this be increased. We're using our ears here entirely. One other thing I can see going on here is the two layers we have for our guitar here. One of them is on the left layer and one of them is on the other left layer. So I should probably sh shift these up um, so that one of them is actually covering the right speaker. This makes it more present anyway. It's a louder track.
Here's actually kind of a cool opportunity. Let's let this stay clean. And then after, whoa, wrong, wrong automation. Let's let this beginning guitar stay clean. And then afterwards, we'll let that kind of distorted guitar swell in. So we have something like this. We do need to probably add a EQ volume increase here as well though, especially because it's by itself. Yeah, very quiet, right? There we go. So we have this cool kind of back and forth between the distorted vibe and the non-distorted vibe. Cool. All right. So that's pretty much it for us. We've gone through, we've really made sure that these different elements are following, you know, the, the sound and the effects that we're really looking for here. Um, we changed some volumes around. We made sure that some of my audio routing was fixed and sorted. So I'm going to play this back for you one last time so we can really hear the effects of our work. Wait a second. I think I missed one thing. Nah, it's all right. We don't need to put a compressor on the drums. They're fine. Um, and so what I what you can do is with the VOD, you know, the video that we upload of this stream after uh, after today, is you can go and you know play the song the very beginning of the VOD and then play the song now at the very end, and you'll hear a good A B difference for what the song sounded like before and what it sounds like now. So. Yeah, I'm going to say goodbye here because when I'm done with the song, um, I'm going to swap out to our outro sequence and I'll hang out in the chat. You know, if you have any questions, you know, please add them to the chat. I'll stick around and answer them for a little while. Uh, but otherwise, it was great to be with you here again. You know, don't forget we have a physical location, 343. It's here in the city. We also have one in Berlin if you're looking to, to meet us out there. Uh, I teach a lot of the courses at our physical location. So if you're looking to, you know, in include um, some actual classes with the, the streams that you attend from us, then you know, reach out to us, send us an email, check our website, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once again, I was Icarus Moth. If you want to find me on Instagram, hit me up. Uh, and otherwise, uh, without further ado, I'll play this back. Thanks a bunch, guys. I'll see you later.